Hello everyone, welcome to our Egyptian online seminar group. First, keep your microphones off. Then if you have any questions, you can ask our speaker during his presentation or after his presentation. I have great pleasure of welcoming Professor Mark Fitcher. Mark Fitcher is one of the top accounting thoughts leaders in the world. He is a professor of accounting and associate dean of faculty at the University of Illinois, Gas College of Business, and as academic director of the Center of uh, for Professional Responsibility in Business and Society. He specialized in behavioral auditing and financial accounting research. He has been published in top ranking journals, including the Accounting Review, Journal of Accounting Research, Accounting Organization and Society, and Contemporary Accounting Research. Now we will start our seminar with Professor Mark Vichar. Well, good morning. If you're in the United States, good afternoon in Egypt, Mohammed. I am so thankful for the chance just to present uh, some work that I, I think is really interesting work. I, and I'm looking forward to feedback received from today's seminar. And the one good thing about Zoom, even though I'd much rather be, and I see some familiar faces, it'd really be great to see all of you in person. One great thing about Zoom is that we can gather globally like this and just share ideas. The chat function is great. I have my co-authors, Spencer Anderson and Jessen Hobson, two amazing co-authors uh, who are on the, the Zoom meeting as well. And Muhammad is kind enough to, he's going to share the chat with me afterwards. So if we don't verbally talk about your, your chat question in today's meeting, we're still going to definitely consider it. And it could well be the case that while I'm talking that Spencer or Jessen is able to dialogue with you uh, while we're talking. So thanks for tuning in. You know, regardless of what time it is, it is a Friday and Fridays are, you know, days leading into uh, a weekend. And so it's just really, um, it's really nice of you to come. And I hope that you find this interesting. The title of the paper, as Mohammed alluded to, is the joint effects of richer, like we probably could say, data visualization in analytical procedure categorization on audit judgment. So <clears throat> let me um, advance the slide here. Oops. Let's see. I'm trying to advance the slide. There we go. And you still see this, correct? You see the practical motivation slide, Mohammed? Yes. So the practical motivation for this paper comes from the, the fact that it's no, no secret that all of the big professional firms and really all of the audit firms that are even regional size have been investing a lot of resources in how do we better communicate properties of the assertions that are being examined to our auditors and also properties of the evidence that would shed light on whether the assertions are fairly stated or misstated and if misstated, materially misstated. Now, one of the most commonly talked about in the marketing um, arms of these firms is really exciting stuff, like becoming very adept at AI, at blockchain, at um, aggregating massive data, pulling down data from the web. Um, I've seen some really cool academic papers about how uh, you can test the, the accuracy of a revenue assertion by looking at how many comments have been made on the World Wide Web about the, the products that the companies are selling. Likewise, you can look at things like Amazon reviews and aggregate those to predict future performance. So there's a lot of really cool possibilities to get more relevant, more diagnostic data in front of the auditor's eyes. But what is really happening more often in the field currently is things like like this. These are really relatively simple visualizations, but they make um, 
they make my down arrows like not wanting to quite work. Let's see. see here okay it, it'll advance with a click of my mouse as well so we're you know redundancy in technology right um so we're looking at very simple pictorial representations of populations often of client data but it can also be other data and when we bring these data to the auditors whether it's a histogram whether it's a simple box and whisker that depiction of underlying population data, we want to enhance the auditor's judgment and let them uh, focus on things uh, much more rapidly with less expenditure of cognitive effort. Because as you know, when you start uh, expending effort, you only have so much energy that you can put into that exercise. Um, as I see my, my friend uh, Tracy on here, sometimes what will happen is you'll become depleted um, as you expend effort. So what we're trying to do within the profession with data analytics and with visualization in particular in our paper, you're trying to enhance human professional judgment, auditor professional judgment by reducing the load on working memory and making it easier to devote the auditor's limited resources, cognitive resources, and the auditor's expert knowledge, let that be brought to bear in a succinct way that can enhance, it can enhance audit effectiveness. So a couple of quotations here that hopefully you've read while I've been talking uh, also point to that. We're not trying to supplant human judgment quite yet, right? AI is really great for, you know, we hear these stories of how artificial intelligence can not only beat chess masters, but also can, you know, uh, beat, uh, if you've played the game of Go, which is a very simple looking game uh, with black and white pebbles on a board, uh, but a very simple game to learn, but very, very hard game to master. And it's a different type of AI technology that is, the, you know, deploying that. And you even maybe have read recently that, you know, we're doing, of course, models to try to figure out what happens next with COVID. And we're also using models and visualization to think about things in the United States of late of how forest fires in the western part of the states will, will grow. But we're thinking at the, at the end of what you're trying to do with all of these tools, from the simplest box and whiskers, whiskers and histograms to very fancy and really impressive, you're trying to bring to bear um, properties, interesting properties of an underlying distribution of interest and seeing perhaps how that underlying distribution co-varies with other distributions. And what we're curious about is how this works in a particular profession, specifically auditing. And if you're not an auditor, I think it would really be good for you to think about, is there a similar type of phenomenon likely to occur in the context that I find the most interesting. Because um, as I get into the paper just a little bit more through this talk, what I'm basically saying is because of the way auditing has traditionally been done and the way that auditors think about categorizing different procedures used in the engagement, what happens is that the nature of the procedure the categorization and the humans have used categories for inductive judgment. It's a very efficiency oriented exercise with our cognition. We see phenomena, we categorize it. We're doing this subconsciously audit all the time. And some of this is done so rapidly because you're trying with your fight or flight response system, you're trying to categorize all the time, you know, friend or foe, right? And if you think you have a foe and there's not, it can be sometimes funny because, you know, maybe you've had the the occasion when you're walking along a sidewalk and you see something move and you duck and there's really nothing there, maybe it was just a branch, but that's just a rapid categorization phenomenon occurring within your mind. And these categorizations happen with repeated practice within a particular context. So if you're not an auditor, when I say these two types of procedures, the type of inductive rapid thinking that we're talking about here is not going to be occurring in your mind risk assessment procedures versus substantive analytical 
procedures. Really, it's a risk assessment analytical procedure or a substantive analytical procedure. And one of the things that my colleagues, uh, Jessen and Spencer and I, you know, some of the, what happens with these, this instantiation and this categorization are very different goals, which has implications for how auditors in turn exercise professional skepticism or not. Or maybe I should say, which has big implications for how extensively the exercise professional skepticism. So the way we manipulate visualization in this paper, if you were looking from some sort of real fancy visualization, you'll be disappointed. It's not like we have you know, pictures of the, uh, the earth with all of the ocean currents, which is in live in real time, which is one of my favorite visualizations. This is just a simple um, richer versus more rich versus less rich representation of accounts receivable at an auditee organization. And if you are, there's not very many left in the world today, but if you are someone who thinks that humans are completely rational, there really isn't any more information content here um, in terms of the things that matter for the audit. What you can see here is the, the aging of over 400,000 individual invoices at an auditee organization. And you see that there's you know, 116,000 that are of the 400. So you can do the math that's 25%-ish you know, uh, that are very current. And then you have a, as you look down the row here, 100,073, you see a, a drop off. It looks to be maybe not quite linear, maybe it's a different function, but then there is an unusual bump up of 32,000. Um, and then it goes back lower again. Uh, that, that relationship among, of, of how old the invoices are and, and um, how, uh, how many of them there are is easier to pick up with a simple bar graph, right? And what you see here in both cases, but that you can see much more rapidly with the richer visualization is that, hmm, it's odd that there is, uh, you know, 33,000 invoices that are pretty old. And you, you, as an auditor, we don't try to have hard and fast statements in the paper about how worried you should be about this, but any auditor who is exercising professional skepticism should, what we like to talk about is, is see that string and just kind of pull on that string a little bit. What, what's going on there? What, is, it, is, it, is it a sign of misstatement? It, it could be a sign of misstatement. Is it a conclusive sign of misstatement? No, but it, it's something that deserves digging into. So the next thing is to, after you know, the visualization idea, I think even non-auditors will really get. The next part is, I previewed it already to some extent, but it's about how does auditing unfold in the real world? And Although there are audit theorists who would say that all of the audit, the entirety of the audit, and I'm, I'm one of those, uh, and, and practitioners as well, there are some leading practitioners we've talked to a number of times about this. And, and one view of the audit, and I think it's a helpful view, is that it is all risk assessment. It is all a um, iterative, diagnostic, and sequential. That's something that Lisa Kuntz, who was a Illinois PhD student now, obviously very well known and very accomplished at Texas, does mostly financial behavioral work these days. Her, she started off doing audit work. And one of the things she said is that analytical procedures is a diagnostic, iterative, and sequential process, but that doesn't, it's not limited to analytical procedures, which is definitionally, definitionally the use of data in relationships to spot unexpected the presence of unexpected fluctuations or the absence of expected you know fluctuations or patterns you could then if you think about what an analytical procedure is and this is one of the things and i see uh, i know i see bill messier is really great to see you here uh, and i know you've had discussions with with my colleague you know ira solomon about really all audit procedures are in some sense an analytical procedure because it's involving setting an expectation 
thinking about data that would help you see if that expectation is there and observing that those data. And if there's concordance, well then that's probably a sign. If your model's good, <laughs> if your expectations are good, that things are okay. But if there's discordance, either something is wrong or your mental model of what's going on in the business, it, it needs updating. So if you think about it, Theoretically, maybe all of the audit should be risk assessment procedure, and maybe at some level, every audit procedure is a complex analytic. But when we start talking about how things unfold in practice, it's not that way. And if you look at auditing standards, it's not that way really either. In fact, audit standards in the last decade, last 15 years, have really galvanized the difference between audit planning and audit execution. It, it, it's talks, it talks about it currently in the PCAOB standards in the United States as assessing the risk of material misstatement, followed by responsive responses to your assessed risk of material misstatement. Um, you can also think of that as risk assessment and then risk, no one says this term, but addressment. Assessing risk and then addressing risk. One of the things that also happens in parallel with this, though, in these standards is that it's the title that is the adjectives that are used to describe these procedures change. And as you get way out at the end of the audit, you're doing substantive tests of transactions and substantive tests of account balance details. Um, early in the audit, not planning, you're, you're really thinking about, OK, where are how much risk of material misstatement is there? And an equally important question, really, if not more important, is what is the source of that risk of material misstatement that I, as an auditor, need to address by looking for evidence, getting that evidence, and then making interpretations of that evidence and conclusions. Um, but the first part of the audit is thought of as risk assessment procedures. And then you start, move, you start migrating towards substantive procedures, maybe test of controls at all. They overlap, however, and what we're looking at in this paper is this overlapping space. Um, so there's already research out there showing that once auditors are near the end of the audit, a really cool paper with um, uh, folks really from Indiana, uh, uh, Lori is on this, Pat and uh, Joe Schroeder's on this paper, and they look at, hey, how, does it, does it does, do auditors engage in more directional motivated reasoning? And what I'm getting at there is that do they really start looking for a way to justify the numbers that management has already in their financial statements? Do they do that to a greater degree when management releases the financials before the audit? And about 70% of the firms for the last decade or so, I think it was last, have start pre-releasing these, these numbers. And that puts pressure on the auditors. And that intensifies motivated reason. That's at the end of the audit. And we, and we can kind of get that because there's intense engagement pressure. And there's, there are, um, and, and another thing is that we've seen going back to even, you know, my dissertation and some of the work um, about the same time by uh, Mark Nelson and Carl Hockenbrock that auditors get these very preferred outcomes. They really don't want to find the statements because they create problems in the budget and it creates uh, difficulty in managing client relationships. There's a lot of work, and I think most of that work is even further out than, you know, it's further this way uh, beyond, beyond um, substantive analytical procedures. It might be like you're reviewing a last minute adjusting entry that client management has made to their books. And it's, you know, it's the fourth quarter and it, or maybe it's even past year in. What we're looking at is a set of procedures that can be classified either as with high justification, a risk assessment procedure or a substantive procedure, a risk assessment analytical procedure or a substantive analytic. And we think that this, this shift between the automatic goals that occur with risk assessment procedures and as opposed to substantive procedures can occur very early in the audit. So there's two ways to think about our paper. Uh, you can think about it as, do, does the richness of data visualization amplify 
the effects of audit procedure categorization, or you could flip these two. And we've had a debate. We've presented this multiple times. Another way of thinking about it is does audit procedure categorization amplify the effects of the richness of data visualization? Either way, it's an interesting interaction. Um, we think of it as an ordinal interaction that has a significant influence on auditor judgments. Now, let me say one more thing about the context that is, is somewhat interesting, I think, um, before I get into this busy theory slide. Um, when auditors do a procedure in an audit planning context, one of the things, now there's not a lot of systematic research on this, but one of the anecdotes we hear commonly when we talk to auditors is that when they do a procedure under the guise of planning, and I, they don't get as much credit from an investigator for doing that procedure. But if it's done within a substantive part of the audit, then it's something that you're getting evidence and you get credit for. It. Now, that we don't have data directly bearing on that in this paper, but I think that that, that creates a little tension. Um, on the other hand, as you will see in our paper, we think the auditors are actually gonna be much more um, actively open-minded thinking, engaging in actively open-minded thinking. Uh, and if you think of the motivated reasoning parlance, it'd be more of an accuracy goal mindset in the audit planning stage. Whereas if they get into audit execution, they're going to be starting to shut down that actively open-minded thinking because they want to wrap up the audit. They want to move from thinking open-mindedly and in really in a professionally skeptical manner, I would say about evidence to a, a let's start backing off that professional skepticism because we're wanting to take credit for the evidence we're gathering. Okay. So, um, so the theory, the theory here is that uh, going back to Johnson Laird and others is that categories are mechanisms that humans use to operate in day-to-day -day life. If we had to process everything we see and say, oh, what is that? Is that something I sit on? Is, or, you know, is that a chair, or a sofa? Is it a Davenport? You know, is it different? We, don't, we, want, we use categorization to be efficient in our day-to-day -day interactions. And after you've been in auditing for a while, we could, I mean, I think a boundary condition might be if I were to test this on, you know, my rookie auditing students, I don't think this effect would manifest. Now, we haven't done that, but I don't, that's what the theory would suggest. But if you get used to doing risk assessment procedures, the implicit goal that's activated, let's start the process. It's more evidence pointing, it's more malleable, more open to change. And as you go down the path of um, the audit, at some point, some procedures are just going to be substantive procedures. There's not a, people don't think of them, at least in practice, as a risk assessment audit planning procedure. Like I said earlier, some theorists would say, that's all risk assessment. Dan Sunderland from Deloitte, you know, I've heard him say time and again, he's, uh, he was like audit, Deloitte's uh, US chief quality officer for audit. Probably not the exact right title. Um, it's all risk assessment. And I think he's exactly right. But that's not the way auditors think. When you start labeling things substantive, I mean, if you think of the root word, it's substantial, it's weighty, okay? The implicit goal activated is to start, let's start finalizing the evidence. Let's provide evidence to justify our beliefs to render an opinion on the financial statements. So what does this cognition have to do with visualization? Well, visualization, brings to the forefront cognitive savings. So now, how do I use this cognitive savings is going to depend on what goals I am pursuing while I'm performing a procedure or while, in Mark Paper's case, while I'm looking at evidence that has been generated by either something called a risk assessment procedure or something called a substantive a risk assessment analytical procedure or a substantive analytical procedure. Exact same procedure has been followed, exact same evidence before the auditor's eyes, just changing the adjective used to describe the procedure. This is not like 
uh, a dissertation that I did 20 some years ago. Well, more than that now, I hate to say, but where we had an audit supervisor say, hey, we really want you to be really skeptical here when you do this. Or another supervisor would say, we really want you to take every bit of knowledge the client has to really enhance the efficiency of our investigations. Okay, they know more about the company than we do. So one of those, the latter was sort of a credence inducing preference from a supervisor. And the former was a skepticism inducing, very blunt, very heavy handed manipulations of supervisor preferences. And at the time it was sort of like, oh, wow, supervisor preferences, but wasn't in the literature affect how auditors you know, respond to the same evidence. We're not, we don't have anything nearly that blunt. We're just saying categorization of audit procedures. <clears throat> so whether and how auditors redeploy the cognitive savings that come about as a result of visualization depends on what are you calling the procedures used to generate the evidence that you're looking at right now, okay? So what do we hypothesize? So it's a little wordy, so I'm gonna read it. The benefits of richer data visuals on auditors on the identification of sensitivity to and planned responses to address incremental risks posed by the presence versus absence of data abnormalities are stronger when the visuals are derived from procedures categorized as risk assessment relative to substantive analytical procedures. So the next part here is we're trying to simplify it. This amounts to a three-way interaction because we, we manipulate not only the goal, excuse me, we don't manipulate the goal directly. We manipulate the categorization of the procedures directly as either risk assessment analytics or substantive analytics. Um, and we manipulate how rich the data visuals are, data visuals are as either richer or less rich. But we also, to test the effect of an abnormality, you cannot have the abnormality present in every condition, right? So we also manipulate the presence or absence of the abnormality. So this does amount to a three-way ordinal interaction where the dependent measures, identification, sensitivity two, and planned responses are relatively higher than just one out of eight conditions, eight conditions created by a two by two by two. Okay, two types of procedure descriptions, two types of data visualization richness and an abnormality there or not. Uh, and, and only one of those eight conditions do we expect these two to go up. And that's when there is the presence of an abnormality, when data visuals are richer and the visualized evidence is categorized as risk assessment. So who, who participates in this? Well, we wanted, um, we wanted auditors who have been studying auditing for a while and practicing auditing for a while, who were familiar with their audit firm's methodology and with audit procedures characterization of analytics. So we ended up uh, with uh, uh, one firm in particular who is to remain anonymous here, but we worked with very closely in developing the case materials. These case materials went back and forth three or four times where multiple very experienced auditing professionals, uh, partners and, and, and managers, but, but not just partners, but just you know, thought leading partners at, at this firm looked at our materials. And one of the things that emerged from this interactive process is that we ended up with a lot of dependent variables. I think that's a really cool part of the paper. The framing in all conditions is that it's October. So we're, we're you know, past the, the second quarter, uh, in the third quarter, and it's a stage at which the same type of evidence that we're bringing to bear in a study could be, could be framed very realistically as either a planning stage analytic or a substantive analytic. The manager in every case 
um, asks them to identify additional substantive tests of details. And what do I, the manager is recognizing, we may not be done yet. Tell us what else we need to do with these details and assess the risk of material misstatement in accounts receivable. Then the case materials say some risk assessment analytical procedures have already been performed or some substantive analytical procedures already had been performed. Now I'll show you the data abnormality. And you've seen, you've seen it already. What you've seen uh, was, you saw earlier in my talk, we saw the data abnormality condition in the more rich and less rich version. These are the richer visualized versions of the absence of a data abnormality and the presence of a data abnormality. Now I have to tell you, you're seeing this all in hindsight, but one big concern we have had going in was how can auditors ever not at least ask a question about this? Not just, not even pull the, pull the string just a little. And if you think about uh, professional standards, professional skepticism needs to be exercised throughout the course of the audit, from acceptance of the client to when you're actually looking at information that comes out after the audit report. It's not like you get you know, uh, a certain point in the audit and you shut down your skepticism. That is not the way audits are designed to work. And if they do work that way, I'm really sure investors want to hear about that. And I bet you that the inspectors of regulatory agencies like the PCOB, and I actually think that leadership at audit firms would be very, and they are interested, we know, would be very interested in this. Here's the, the so the data abnormality was a, we used two factors, if you will, to uh, joint factors to manipulate this. The other thing was, is that in one case, the distribution of, this is the little different data. This is the individual customer receivable accounts by magnitude. And so in one setting, you have a normal looking distribution of the individual customer's total balance due. Um, and I know that by, you can pick different bins on histograms and you can make the histograms look different. You know, we're, the bin size is the same here. That's not what we're, we're messing with here. In another one though, it is a, um, a bimodal looking distribution. And I, you know, this one is to me is not as worrisome necessarily as the one just prior, but it's also, if I'm an auditor, I wanna understand, are there two different, you know, fundamental different types of customers here? Or is there sort of like a business to business side and a business to retail customer side, what's going on here? So some participants saw the orange graphs and others saw the blue. And then others just saw the, uh, they didn't have the bar graphs, they just saw the information. This is the data visualization. So in our paper, we have a series of nine dependent variables. And we like that because some of these variables are auditor judgment. You know, what are your assessments? What are your judgments? And others are more about their planned actions, much more, what are you gonna do about it? Okay, what do you, how worried are you about things is some of our variables. How worried are you? How concerned? How much comfort? And then others are, what do we, you think we need to do about it as an audit firm? So to get at some of those action-oriented DVs, we have not just simply Likert scales, but we also have open-ended responses that we code. We look at some quantitative aspects of their responses, like how many characters there are but we code them. You know, the literature on professional skepticism is really extolling the benefits of not just stopping with what risk assessment we have. So here's a real quick 20,000 feet look at our results using these nine uh, dependent variables. And the way it works is that with this I'm trying to think, I think, it, it, I'm not sure if this table, I, I made this table up before the talk. Uh, I don't think these are necessarily organized in the way they unfolded in the, in, the, in the sheet, but this is just a 
representation in, in the case materials. This is a representation of the nine variables. The, the, the goal of this is to let you see what DVs did we not get hypothesis consistent results? And, in, and that's these gray boxes. And by the way, in no case were the results like running the other way. It's just that, and in two or three of this is that there's just hardly any variation. One of the most interesting uh, places where we saw the absence of a result, which we would not have anticipated going in, was, was there a change in the assessed risk of material misstatement in accounts receivable? And while there was a statistically significant increase in assessed risk of material misstatement in the presence of an abnormality compared to its absence, that was true across all conditions, and it was a very small effect. We had a one to 100 scale on assessed risk of material misstatement. And basically it went from somewhere like below 10 on that scale to somewhere close to 10. And we were a little surprised by that. When we presented this work to the firm and to some of the most expert partners in the firm, and uh, really people you know, charged with audit methodology at the firm, they were not surprised because the culture is, you know, once there is a risk assessment reported, it, it, this hasn't, you need to move, something momentous needs to occur for this to be the big change in the recorded level of risk of material mistake, which is kind of news, news to us. And maybe that's only very contextually the case within, within what we have here, to be clear. Um, which is what we have is an analytical procedure in field work that could be a risk assessment procedure or a substantive analytic. Now, audit standards, by the way, the only, the only time the auditor can have a substantive analytical procedure is if the risk of material misstatement you know, is somewhat low. And that, that might be another reason you had a cap effectively here. Um, so that's, that's interesting. So the ones where we got the results um, expected are, were abnormalities is the source of the risk. So this is a, the quantity of risk, is it going up? And the next, this one here is given the risk is about the same in you know, every condition, assess the level of risk, what is the source of that risk? And we look at, is the abnormalities that I just showed you on the pre preceding pages, is that the source of the highest risk that exists? Even though we don't have high, in an abs absolute sense, perceived risk of material misstatement here, what is driving that risk of material misstatement that is there? Is it the abnormalities? And you, you get a big effect consistent with our hypothesis with that. You see, um, when auditors are asked in an open-ended way um, for a, what additional inf information or evidence do you want, do they say they want that because of the abnormalities? Um, were the abnormalities used as the reason for subdividing the population? So these here are all sort of source of risk of material misstatement proxies to me. Then the next three on which we find statistically significant results that are hypothesis, consistent with our hypothesis, our three based hypothesis, uh, is more what are you going to do about it? Okay. And one is a very important uh, substantive test of details around accounts receivable. If you know auditing, uh, if you're really trying to test like the existence and valuation of receivables. Uh, one of the gold standards to use is positive form confirmations, coupled with subsequent cash collections, okay? The idea being, you know, if someone is sending the audited entity cash, they owe the, the entity money, uh, right? Uh, and then, if the firm, the audited entity's customers send back a confirmation saying, yes, we acknowledge we owe your client, you know, $100,000 or whatever, that's pretty telling. Uh, 
especially if that's you know not a related party, right? Um, the weakest form of evidence that you can, if, if you want to say this, get away with in an audit, you have to, you really almost have to perform some confirmations in the United States anyway. Um, goes back to a McKesson's and Robbins case, but uh, the, the different form of confirmation for the non-auditors, you know, in the, in the meeting is something called a negative confirmation. And a negative confirmation, I know I'm boring the auditors here, but a negative confirmation is you send out uh, either electronically or through the, or the postal service a document and basically it, the customer opens it up and it says, hey, we're the auditors. Uh, the client we're looking at says you owe $100,000. If that's right, don't reply. Reply only if something's wrong here. And so in the negative confirmation case, you're assuming no news is good news. In the positive confirmation case, you have to get a message back from your audit client's customers. And if you don't get it back, you'll send another request. And if you don't get it back, you'll follow up with a phone call or, or some other mechanism, okay? And then the other asset tests or receivables kind of going even further is to ramp up subsequent cash collections. So our, our results are really interesting there. Uh, I'll talk about them in a minute. And then how much effort was put into thinking critically in an active open-minded way to me, that's a proxy for exercising professional skepticism. Um, it's just how much, how much thought was going on as proxy by how many characters are in their open-ended response. And then probably more telling is that we had independent coders look at and, and sort of assess the quality, if you will, the comprehensive and the depth of the planned additional tests. So that's what we got. So now let's look at some graphical depictions of these of these findings so and i'm not presenting to be fair and to to be very clear i'm not i'm presenting more information about the green ones here uh, i don't have a graph for example of the change and assess risk misstatement and over here the thing we saw and this is you know i'll follow my story this was this was my idea this dv and i think it was not a bad idea but we i we just asked the question in a too blunt of a manner. I was after the idea here, I was trying to get at, a, do we think we need our best auditors on this or above average auditors or can anybody do this? And it was too blunt because we just said rank and what we got in all the conditions, they said two thirds of the time, you know, a good staff person could do this. And then another third of the time, a senior should be doing this. Maybe in retrospect, you know, that's the thing about experiments, but in retrospect, maybe we could have asked, you know, do you want someone with an above average performance evaluation or something like that, but we didn't get that. So let's look at the a graph of the means is of the DV being likelihood that the auditors identify the abnormality as the source of the highest risk of material misstatement. And again, this is about, this is the source to me. We don't have a difference on the level of assessed risk, but we do have differences on what is the source of risk and what are you going to do about it. So when the data abnormalities are, are absent, uh, there's just, you know, there's no identifying of the, of what they see as abnormalities. Uh, you know, there's not really this sore thumb sticking out in the graph. But the more interesting result is that how different do auditors react when there are data abnormalities compared to when there are not? So we could, you know, even do a changed, you know, if, if they could have a changed version of this where the abnormalities versus present versus absent. But what you'll find is that this, this line here, which corresponds to the auditors who were told, hey, the graphs you have are the numbers you've been provided with emerged from substantive analytics what you'll have is that, first of all, uh, this line is not, although directionally, we don't have uh, you know, a small enough standard deviation. We cannot reject the null hypothesis here that this line is different than this line. Uh, this level right here, this average really, this average of about 0.12 is not significantly lower than this average of about 0.35. So there's not, sufficient power perhaps, 
but there's just not a sufficiently low alpha level. Our P test P value is just not low enough for us to even say that auditors who saw the abnormality were even responding to it in a statistically significant way. So this orange line is just not differing across. The one place where you see this big difference is the simple effect, right, of the abnormality given the presence of richer visuals and the presence of a risk assessment procedure categorization. The abnormality mattered to these auditors. You have an average of a 65% here, if you will, or likelihood compared to you know, 0.18. This is a big significant difference. The p values, you know, quite, quite low. Um, and you also have another uh, interesting simple effect is, is this line reliably upward sloping? And it is. So you have, you have auditors who have, you see the power of visualization. Can it help our auditors identify where the greatest source of risk is for a given level of risk? Yes, very clearly it can. But what mutes that is if we're in a substantive analytic stage. This is no different than flat. And the overall pattern here is consistent with our hypothesis because our hypothesis, the way we test it is basically we have zeros on, on these and we say, we think this is going to be diff the highest one of all. And so the way we have a contrast here is called you know, contrast coding. We treat this as a three and then this is a negative one, negative one, negative one. That comes back as highly statistically significant. Okay. The likelihood of not just separating into subsamples, but separating into subsamples, why? Based on the data abnormalities. So what's triggering this separating the accounts receivable into subsamples? And this is, you know, if you're an audit person, you know, you're always looking for a reason to stratify the population so that you can focus on the areas of highest ex ante risk and not focus as heavily on the areas that present less, you know, ex ante risk. Here you see uh, basically the same pattern, but um, you know, as, as experimentalists, we tend to focus on the, the presence of predicted contrasts. And we see that here. This is again, uh, significantly higher than, than this and that simple main effect. There is a response um, and you have an upward sloping line here. <clears throat> but, <clears throat> excuse me. But from an audit firm protection, reputation per protection perspective, and from a regulator perspective, and from an investor perspective, what really is as, if not more um, interesting, is just the absence of any reliable evidence in a statistical sense that auditors are responding to the abnormalities when the evidence was generated by something called the substantive analytic. And of course, that's the power of experimentation because we contrast how the risk assessment procedure mindset or goals that are implicitly triggered uh, results in a very different take by auditors. On the extent of confirmation testing, um, what you see here is something that both confirms or is both consistent with what we were getting at, but also shows one of the other advantages of richer data visualizations. If we just focus on the, the auditors who said these data are gen have been generated under the risk assessment characterization, what you see is that with richer visuals, they actually, when there's not an abnormality, they derive comfort from that. Okay, so you saw those graphs and in, in the absence of the abnormality, it was just a nice tale of how aging of the individual invoices. And when you looked at the average balance, it was a nice normal curve. Those distributions that are much more easy to recognize with the stronger visual, that actually generates comfort. I think what you're seeing here, uh, and I can't, I don't know that this is downwardly sloping in a significant way, but what I'm pointing at here is that this is significantly lower consistent with our predictions than, than this response, okay? So when there is 
the presence of abnormalities, the auditors who are in the risk assessment procedure condition, they are saying we need to do more positive confirmations and we need to do more subsequent tests of cash receipts. Uh, the other auditors are not. And over here, there was one place when we looked at what these auditors act, uh, said we needed to do next. What these auditors said we needed to do next, which is really great in the sense that it shows us they saw the abnormality. They said, let's send a few more negative, let's send more negative confirmations. And so if you think about that, the perfect lens for explaining that is motivated reasoning theory. When, when, there, when, when there was, let me be clear, let me communicate the, the result. When data abnormalities were present versus absence, uh, this graph is not about negative confirmations. This graph is about positive confirmations and subsequent cash receipts. That's the DV here, okay? The combination of subsequent cash receipts testing and positive confirmation. That's the diagnostic evidence uh, for confirmation, for, for confirmation, and counts receivable. But if I were to graph, what do we do with negative confirmations? Um, what you would see is that the auditors in the substantive analytical procedure categorization respond to that, and they don't respond uh, otherwise. And it's not wildly significant, as I recall, but it is significant. But so that's, what that is to me is, wow, I've been presented with this incontrovertible evidence that something's odd about these distributions. I can't not do anything. I must do something. So I wanna do the least something and that's negative confirmations. Kind of a cool result that I wish I could say that we thought of. We put, we broke it down to negative, positive and subsequent cash receipts because that's kind of convention in auditing. And I think actually the firm helped us with that. The number of characters that auditors listed in their responses to describe what it is we need to do and what are we going to do about this risk uh, is very consistent with our hypothesis. Uh, they started thinking more. If you believe that the number of characters in an open-ended response is a proxy for the depth of processing, they started thinking about what they need to do about the risk to a greater degree when there's greater visualization richness, when it's a risk assessment procedure, and when the abnormality is present, than absent. Uh, the overall contrast is significant. You see some evidence of an efficiency gain with more visuals. I don't believe that this is significantly downward sloping, but this is significantly upward sloping. And the overall pattern, you know, three, negative one, negative one, negative one, and treat these all as zero is very significant. And then when we had uh, coders uh, look at and code the depth and the comprehensiveness of the ratings of the auditor's open in response, you see another uh, pattern that generates the same sort of, okay, this is really hypothesis consistent. And, and you know, they're thinking more, more comprehensively more in depth. We could go back and from previous workshop comments, maybe we could go back and look at the creativeness. Like that, was there particularly creative? Are they thinking out of the box more in this particular setting? Maybe that's another ad we could do. But the really disappointing thing, if you're, I think if you're an investor or you know, potentially a regulatory inspector, is that once you get the same exact evidence in a very salient way, right in front of these auditors' faces, it's basically, there's not even a blip on the radar, right? They're not, this difference here is not lower than this difference. And in fact, they're nearly identical. We also wanted to get some theory, uh, we wanted to subject our theory about automatic goal activation being different for analytical procedures that are characterized as risk assessment versus analytical procedures that are characterized as substantive testing, okay? This would have been 
really critical, I think, you know, had we had a bunch of null effects <laughs> and, and, and then we would say, wow, our theory is just wrong. Uh, so we asked them using sliders to say, to what extent are the following attributes equally representative of risk assessment analytics versus substantive analytics? And so what we found is evidence providing difficult diagnostic, and we stuck with diagnostic because in our conversations with practitioners, uh, diagnostic, you know, if you're a practitioner, is like triage. It's like you go in for um, a quick diagnostic to see if you need to see a real doctor, you know, if a physician or um, it's not what a Bayesian, you know, belief revision theorists would think of as what's the expected diagnosticity of a test. That's not what we're getting at with this, the way the English word is used amongst practitioners. Is it unnecessary? Is it repetitive? Is it something we're doing, you know, mainly for compliance, we're just going through the motions as opposed to really doing, I'm ad living here, obviously, uh, really doing the audit. You know, there's a real purpose behind it besides compliance. Is it important? Is it essential? And so what we find here is that the perceptions of the auditors, this is all gathered post-test, these data. Um, and what we found, and I do not, this does not differ across auditors who were in the, which double check, I do not believe this differs, and Jason or Spencer can correct me, that this result differs depending on whether uh, auditors were randomly assigned to the substantive analytic versus risk assessment condition. But the overall finding here is that auditors think that, hey, where we really get the evidence is, uh, thank you, Spencer, where we really get the evidence is in a substantive analytic compared to a risk assessment procedure. And see, this is, this is inherently, this is this in conjunction with the results I just discussed, I think is fascinating, right? Because they're saying where we really get the evidence is precisely where we just saw from the results where we're not doing anything about it. Um, repetitive and important. Uh, not a significant difference here. And then they thought of risk assessment as being more diagnostic, what I think of as triage or preliminary. Now, it's not the word we use, so that's just me interpreting it. Mainly for compliance and unnecessary. Uh, interesting one on difficult because um, I don't have a real good answer for that. You know, maybe it's because it's so open ended for these professionals. But where you see auditors responding to the height, the, the marker, the cues that are a potential sign of material misstatement, is it a definitive sign? No, not really a definitive sign but it's a worrisome sign that you need to pull. You need to pull, I call it pull that string. You can look, look under the rug. You can think of whatever analogy that works or idiom. You need to dig further. You need to have an active, open-minded attitude, a professionally skeptical attitude towards the sevens. And you just don't see that in the substantive testing stage, even though auditors say that's where we really get the evidence. So conclusions that we think, um, you know, we can take away here. Well, data visualization, as previous papers have shown, really can and does, of course, reduce effort expenditure needed to spot an abnormality that is an unexpected thing, an unexpected data point or fluctuation. And that frees up the auditor's mental capacity. The issue is how effectively do auditors use that freed up capacity? Or, and they could just bank it. What I mean by that is that, you know, auditors like other humans are cognitive misers is the phrase that I think that Inger Renzer may have been the first to say, but it's a psychologist. Um, effort averse. 
what we think we have here is that more richly visualized data abnormalities uh, can indeed increase auditors. What we need to say here, this is a little, this is us thinking uh, about our priors where it can indeed increase auditors focus of where they think the risk of material misstatement is because it didn't really change their assessed level of the risk of material misstatement. It changed what is the cause, the source of that assessed risk of material misstatement. But it very clearly changed what follow on substantive test details they think we really need to do here. But it was only when the visualized evidence was characterized as risk assessment procedures. When the visualized evidence is characterized as a substantive analytic, the auditors seem quite clearly to be reluctant to ascribe the heightened risk to the client data abnormalities or to conduct follow-up substantive tests. So, and I, I love your thoughts on this, either through the chat or even when I finish up here, which I you know I didn't go the whole time, but that's okay. Um, Visualizations, I think we knew that it was not a panacea, but I think we have identified a previously unconsidered or underconsidered cost. We need to be careful about where we deploy these visualizations within an audit. You know, if you're a firm that's wanting to get credit for the work you're doing, there might be and we don't test this particular issue in this paper, there might be a preference. It's very testable, someone can do this experiment. If you wanna get credit from the inspectors for a given bit of evidence, should you call that evidence as having come from risk assessment procedures or substantive analytics, I think most auditors mental models would be, yeah, we should call it substantive. And that's what we saw, you know, that substantive was in the post-test results. But, but what, where were you actually um, have auditors responding to that evidence in an active, open-minded way, which in turn, which is a bit ironic, right, which in turn will cause you to do more work in the substantive evidence category, which is when you're going to get credit for that work, is, is the hope. Uh, there's the whole literature on do auditors really get credit for more work. We can talk about that if you want. Um, you should, you should think about keeping things in the risk assessment category. In, in a more longer term implication is maybe audit standard setters, maybe there would be benefits of changing the overall motif of the way standards are characterized. I mean, you can go back to, I, don't, I think IAASB, IAASB or PCAOB or AICPA standards, they all have, and I get it because there's a harmonization, but they all have this motif. One of the main themes is that you have audit planning and audit execution. You have audit risk assessment, and then you're addressing those assessed risks. Um, whereas another motif would be, yeah, things are changing, but you're always engaging in assessment of risk, address, how do we address it? And then you reassess the risks and address it further as needed when you reassess the risk. That could be another motif. That might be a better way of writing audit standards. So I think there's a potential, not in any, any one paper, but I think this is a paper that layered on with others could be something if I were a standard set, I would think, well, do we have the right mental model that we're creating in auditors with this planning for then performance uh, way of characterizing things? Um, and then is there the possibility this is all kind of future work, right? Do inspectors exasperate, exacerbate the use of this label? You know, that's conjecture. So that, that's really all I prepared to talk to you about today. You know, I don't have um, a full hour and a half of, of presentation, but you know, I would love to just be sure to give airtime to anyone who has a question. I see that yeah, I, don't have, I don't have the, um, full audience here, but I see that Bill Messier has his hand raised. Yeah, thank you very much, Professor Mark, for this uh, an excellent presentation. Thank you very much. And uh, now, uh, if anyone has any questions, you can uh, open your mic and ask your question. Uh, Professor uh, William, you can ask. Uh, yeah. 
Hey, Mark, good to see you. It's um, really good to see you. You know I've spent a lot of time on this stuff, including having written some of those standards. Oh, I know. Yeah, um, I wasn't trying to be so, super uh, crit critical. There, there is a new standard out on audit evidence from the piece from the ASB and the PCAOB says they will adopt it. They did it to accommodate a lot of the stuff you're talking about here, mainly the ADAs. Um, awesome. I, I, one, of the, one of the issues I have is a little bit what you've talked about in, in risk assessment versus substantive tests. If, if you look at the standards and what practice says is that analytical procedures are used for three purposes, risk assessment, substantive tests of, an, of a data and final analytics. Yep. And there are two distinct differences in those first two. When you're using it for risk assessment, you're just trying to find out whether something is amiss. So your first plot where you have the abnormality, that would say to me is if I'm doing this to risk assess, I have something wrong there and I have to figure out what's going on, okay? If you couch that as a substantive test, an analytical substantive test, then I'm actually gonna to have to test that blip. So the, 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 the well, framing here is really important, okay? Yeah. Because the risk assessment use of analytics is attention directing. It doesn't say anything about doing tests. It just says you should think about it. But when you say you're going to use it as a direct substantive test, the definition says you are directly testing an assertion in the data. Yeah, well, that's right. So you have to be really careful what you say after the fact here. I know what the data says to you, but I think from a practical point of view, I think there's some things that would worry me. And your plot says that. The very first plot you put up there, where at the, the plus three, minus one, minus one, minus one, yeah. that's exactly what that says. Yeah. Because in, in, the, in the data, in the data ab abnormality one, the risk of, of a material misstatement for the ones doing risk assessment is the very highest point. And that's because they're saying, look, something is wrong here, given that I'm doing this as a risk assessment procedure. And I've got to do something more. So they're going to automatically do that. So I, yeah, I mean, the we story needs to be a little yeah, bit. I, by know, the way, I should admit, I didn't read the paper. So, yeah. <laughs> uh, but I think that's, the, the, the story's a little tangled here. No, so, okay, let's just do a little thought experiment, not to take too much time here, and we can certainly follow up because I know you'd be exactly one of the people we'd love to hear more about and I can send you the paper. <laughs> but, you know, let's say all of it, let's concede a lot of that. And I would concede some of it. But let's, then you would, then it's all the more shocking that it's all the more shocking than after running a, a graph and you're saying this is a substantive analytic, you should be saying, we need to do some confirmations or I mean, that blip right there. That blip right there that I need to test, just like you said, we need to do that, but they don't do that. Yeah, that I didn't get to that part of the story. That that's troublesome. Okay. Yeah. First of all, no one would ever use it. Well, no one should ever use a negative confirmation in that scenario. Well, that, uh, I would love to be the expert witness in that case. I know, right? Uh, but but my but I think I think the, that that result is shocking. But you gave them the choice. If I were the, the other thing that. Uh, you put up there is the two graphs where they're bimodal graphed. If I'm the senior on the job from the prior year, or yeah. if I'm a new senior, there's gonna be documentation that I have a bimodal distribution for receiving, I, right? Or, or if there's, if that wasn't documented and you see this, <laughs> like you're Well, saying. then I raise a question, yeah. But you don't allow for that option. Yeah, I don't know so what- let me, give you an let me give you an example. I did a Fortune 500 company where there were 10,000 customers and 70% of the dollars were in 300 of them. Yeah. So how would you audit that? Well, you ignored 9,700 and audited 300, right? So I, again, I understand it's an experiment, but I think we need to be a little bit careful with, because the analytical procedure stuff, I think is still abused in practice. It's not used very well. Yeah, yeah. And, 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 and I, just as a passing comment, the data visualization you've done is the same stuff Ben Bazat did back in, the 80s in information systems research and management. We should science. probably be sure that, we're that's a no, no, yeah. yeah. No, I, I, I complain when because I'm an old guy. You're not, well, you know, you're a lot younger than I am. <laughs> well, people don't cite their work in the 80s or even or the 70s, you know, 
uh, or, there's a lot of good work that's not properly right. cited. So if we're missing no, some, no, that's fine. I just, but I, my, my point is, I think, and I, and I'm send you the paper. I'll things. send you the paper and the instrument, and I know you're busier or not, but I would love your comments after you. I'm on them. my way to retirement, partner. I know. <laughs> I'm, I know. I know. By the way, that picture behind me is the only sunny day in Bergen, but I'm in Las Vegas, so it's sunny here all the time. I'll let somebody else talk. I'll get off. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, Brett Hong. Hey, Mark. Great to see you. Good to see you. And I, you're going to be presenting in Illinois. I want to, want to catch that. That's going to be excellent. But go ahead. That would be awesome. Um, I find the paper very interesting, uh, and uh, I'm sorry if I missed this uh, during your talk. Um, I just wonder, can you share your thoughts on um, the mechanism for the results, uh, for the effect of cat categorization or how the uh, procedure is labeled? Uh, my question is, is it more of a cognitive effect or a motivational effect? Um, at, at the earlier of the talk, at first I thought the label uh, triggers different types of processing, closed-minded versus uh, open-minded, so that's more cognitive. But then later, I also thought about uh, if the procedure is labeled as um, analytic, uh, substantive procedures, maybe auditors just want to get the work done, right? They want to finish it uh, rather than start it. So that's uh, similar to like a motivated reasoning, as you mentioned. So which, which of the mechanism is under play here? So I know you pretty well, Bright. So I think you're asking a very good faith question, but I also say a, a trial lawyer would be backing me into a corner by saying is it either or. <laughs> because it's not, it's not either or, it really isn't. So in fact, if you go back to some of the old research on even hindsight bias, one of the early branches of that literature was, is this, is this a cognitive thing causing hindsight bias or is it a, is it a motivational thing causing hindsight bias? And uh, people, I think where we're at now, of course, science is only the science that exists today is that there's not this uh, clean border between cognition and motivated, the mo hot cognition, warm cognition, and cold cognition that they can feed off you know, one another. And I think that it's a combination of, you know, the way auditors, when they're rookies, I don't think you're gonna have the same rapid goal instantiation that's very different in risk assessment versus substantive procedures. But I think that the certainly different motivational goals um, start popping up in the audit. I do think, and I'm gonna analogize, I did this at another recent presentation. The motivator reasoning story works really well here. What's different about our paper, I think, is that a lot of the papers that are out there put auditors in a stage of the audit where it's really clear that direction goals are gonna be very, very operative, very dominant. But at the beginning you know, of an audit, if there's ever a stage where you want to be open-minded, it's going to be there. And so that's where we, that's where this, what I'm trying to convey with this uh, slide here is that we're trying to look at this part of overlap when, because the assessed risk of material misstatement is, is low, and as Bill knows, you can't even call an, an analytical procedure a substantive procedure unless you think there's a pretty low risk of material misstatement. Uh, it's, it's like, in that stage of an audit where you maybe, one way of thinking about it, right, is that you might be transitioning from some pure, not that it's any ever pure, but some accuracy goal motivation because of habit. And it's not like I'm thinking the auditors are motivated, you know, consciously to be accuracy oriented at the beginning. I think it's part of their, this is the environment in which their day-to-day -day lives, this is the way audit works out. But they have what Ziva Kunda would call an accuracy goal mostly early on. And when you get, get, it doesn't have to wait till the very end, but at some point in the judgment decision-making process, uh, you start focusing more on your, your directional reasoning. And 
we're saying that can happen with a simple adjective, substantive analytics versus risk assessment analytics. Um, the analogy that Ziva Kunda, I think is the one who had this analogy in her book was, you know, if you're looking for a home or a condominium, condominium, an apartment, you know, when you first start out on this course, you're, you're pretty even handed and objective and uh, actively open-minded thinking. But then you start seeing a few condos or homes that you, you, you like, and you're not done with the decision-making process, but there's a subtle shift in your mindset uh, in your goal space where you start wanting that home to be the one. And you start wanting that apartment to be the one and that your, your cognition starts now you're starting to have some directional goals that rival the, the accuracy goal space. We don't talk a lot about that in this paper as it's written now, but we probably could do more of that just to at least tell readers where we think that this is situated relative to other motivated reasoning papers. We know that auditors engage in motivated reasoning. We've known that for a long time. What I think is different in this paper is just how a subtle categorization of a, the exact same audit procedure can flip their thinking. And I think it's for a combination, a mosaic of cognition and co what we think of co cognitive and motivational reasons. You know, they, it's clearly when it's the substantive analytic, you don't see any follow on engaging in uh, effortful. Uh, you can think of it from a system one, system two thinking as well, but an effortful process, right? Where, whereas in the risk assessment procedures, they, they're much more willing to engage in that. So I don't think it's one or the other. Yeah, thank you, Mark. That's really helpful. Um, it also, when I was listening to your presentation, um, it also reminds me of the uh, Goal Witzer's mindset theory of action phases. Yes, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, there's some similarity there. Yeah, I wonder. Yeah, it's it's very you... analogous and bright. Is that not in your mind very analogous to isn't deliberative and accuracy and directional goal and implemental mindsets? Aren't they really analogous? Right. And I thought about in the theory of action phases, what kind of phase are these uh, phrases tied to? Um, for risk assessment, what I can think of, it could be deliberate. Uh, deliberation or evaluation, whereas um, the substantive procedure might be implementation and uh, acting. Yeah, I love that. What we probably should do is say, hey, the phenomena we're studying can be viewed from, there's a number of complementary theoretical lenses out there, motivated reasoning, goal, you know, Sekunda. Uh, then you start seeing, you know, with the uh, Obviously, people who are on your dissertation committee with, with Catherine Caduce being one of the big thinkers here about Goldweitzer and the action spaces stuff. Yeah, uh, I'm not, I don't think our paper is designed to, you know, see which of these theoretical frameworks is better explanatory power in the audit setting, but the, we can use the language of either of those to, to sort of situate the paper, I think. Thank you, Mark. Oh, thank you. Uh, Professor uh, Tracy, can I ask? Hi, Mark. It's great to see you. <laughs> see you too. Um, really enjoyed your talk and um, really enjoyed the paper. Really interesting. Um, and I had some similar thoughts to Bright, just being very curious about the mechanism because I found the results really fascinating. Um, and I kept kind of thinking, is the risk assessment kind of boosting them, helping them really be skeptical? Or is it the substantive analytic framing is, you know, dragging them down somehow? And I feel like it seems like the substantive analytic framing could be kind of dragging them down. And I just kept thinking about why. And I feel like this is related to what you and Bright were talking about. But is there something like from one hand, maybe it makes them feel more threatened at the thought of, oh, no, if I go down in this investigation, and this might be consistent with your negative confirmation result. And I find something that this is, you know, going to be worrisome. It could cause a lot more things. And maybe I should kind of be done if I'm at this point versus the risk assessment is more open minded. Like, it's OK if I have to go down. We could, that. We, could, hole. <laughs> yeah, we could have asked. We could have asked a question like, to what extent? I don't know if we would have gotten 
the mm -hmm. measurement lasts from these participants, but maybe another you know, fallout. Like so in the following scenario, you're in a risk assessment, describe the risk assessment, it's October, and you see something that might change the audit plan. How upset do you think, kind of like the speaking out stuff, right? How upset mm -hmm. do you think the supervisors will be? They'll probably, well, they, won't, they won't like this. This will suck. Yep. This will not be good. I'll find something. But if it's a substantive analytic, yeah, one of the implicit, not a, the supervisor's words on paper were the exact same. Tell me what mm -hmm. the additional substantive test of details we should do. But the, it could be, and Han Tong said this not too long ago to us, which is, it could be that it could be nudge, nudge, wink, wink. We, wanna, we don't want to go down that path. And you better have a really good reason. I mm -hmm. mean, as I say, you better have a really good reason for us changing our audit plan now, buddy. You know, <laughs> you know, so that could be part of what's going on. But I think that's all part of mm -hmm. when you say substantive I would say that's what comes with those things could be instantiated in, in, in the mind of the auditors. And we have, we've captured some of that cognition with that sort of last slide about for compliance diagnostic, yes. but we didn't have like a, an attribute being uh, satisfying my supervisor or something like that, which, you know, could be in there. Um, yeah. Well, you were saying that um, I had another thought, but it's, you know, it's come in and out of my mind. So it'll probably, it'll probably come back after I end the call. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll have to chat again. Cause yeah, it's <clears throat> really interesting. Um, and I also had one more thought. Um, sure. I kind of was thinking about um, when you were talking about the categorization, yeah. could it also be something fundamentally different about the framing of the task? Like I think of risk assessment as, you know, kind of semi-structured, not too structured versus maybe a substantive analytic could be more structured. So could it be the kind yeah. of categorization of semi-structured makes me feel more open to going down this path versus structured could make me kind of more closed off. I just was very curious. I think it's- I think that's also part of it. Now, you don't, none of us saw the, uh, you know, the entirety of the instrument, none of the you know, participants today, but, um, you know, what was basically told to them was, this is some of the highlights here, but then it says what you see on the next page is the result of our risk assessment procedures, or what you see on the next page is the result of our substantive analytics. And so our task wasn't sort of say, hey, go do, I totally agree with you. If I said, go do risk assessment procedures on a counter receipt, that's gonna be probably more, well, that's an ill-structured task. And maybe mm -hmm. there's an audit program for how you do that might bring some structure. Whereas if I say do a substantive analytic on, you know, accounts receivable, that might be, that might be viewed as more structured. What do I do? Common size, the financial statements, look at, um, look at the aging analysis, you know, things like that. But I think that's part, I think that's part of it, but we, the way this, the task was framed in this, in this paper is that we showed them evidence and we told them that this evidence came about as a result of planning stage analytics or risk sub substantive analytics mm -hmm. and we want to know what to do next mm -hmm. yeah thanks mark well thank you <laughs> okay are there another questions if anyone have any questions you can open your mic and ask your question Can I ask another question? Yes, sure. Um, and so Mark, another question came into my mind. Um, what are your thoughts on having the uh, abnormally absent condition? Uh, it, it appears to me that you could just have the abnormally present condition and do a two by two for testing your research question, right? Or am I? Ron, well, what are the, your thoughts about well that? it was I would tell you that if if I were designing an experiment and didn't know that I could get a couple hundred auditors um, and you and you told me you had to run a two by two um, I don't think it would have been like risk assessment procedures only and, and you know, I, I think we would have we would have held constant the abnormality present. But this gives us a real 
a better counterfactual because what we're looking at now is the response to the abnormality. You know, we have a manipulation of the abnormality rather than just, a, rather than us asking our readers to say, take it on faith that the participants saw the abnormality in both conditions, in the more rich versus less rich. And we would think that more participants would see it in the more rich condition. And we're, we're fortunate that suppose we had run the design that you had suggested, we really would have been happy then with the finding that in the substantive analytical procedures condition that those auditors said we need to do more negative confirmations because that would be direct evidence that they, when the data abnormality was present. So when the data abnormality was present, but not when it was absent, the way that the substantive analytical auditors responded to the presence versus the absence, they said more negative confirmations. See, that would have been almost necessary for us to get that response because if the substantive analytic auditors had no response and it was just always the, then you could always say, well, did they even see that abnormality, right? And, and of course you could say, well, they should have seen it. But if you manipulate the abnormality is there or not, then you have the ability to see how these four conditions created by our more theoretically relevant two factors, the procedure characterization and the visualization being less rich or more, how they really affect auditor's response to the abnormality being there or not. It's just a better design. It's just, in the real, in the practical world of auditors, I mean, now we're, I mean, it's just so hard to get auditors and maybe the pandemic is a blip that's negatively affecting that. But if you get 80 auditors now for experiment, it's, it's great, right? Uh, so we had the leeway here, so we took it. Thank you, Mark. Yeah, I do find the extent of confirmation results when abnormal, how to pronounce, abnormalities are absent. Interesting. Yeah. So do I. Yeah, is there another question? If anyone have any questions, you can open your mic and ask your question. Uh, thank you very much, dear Professor Mark uh, for your contribution and your effort. It's really, it's really an excellent presentation. Uh, thank you very much and it's all that remains for me uh, to say is thank you everyone that's joined us uh, and i thank you very one very much for taking the time i want to present to us today dear uh, professor mark it's been really appreciated thank you very much well thank you everyone for the comments not only the ones that were verbalized here but also the chat i'm looking through in this a little bit and the great comments and i think let's all give muhammad a hand let's all let's all clap and react because how this has been such a great thing in the pandemic to have you, you you've done something that i don't know if you realize i mean it's really helped the research community stay vibrant so i really appreciate it very very good foresight and good luck as you pursue your your phd in accounting thank you very much Dibro. it's my pleasure thank you and i hope to see you soon in egypt Dibro. goodbye Thank you, everyone.